Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. God wants us to get angry. Things aren't as they should be, but righteous anger is costly. It costs your tears, your talent, and your time. So come along, ready to cry, get angry, pick a fight, and change some small but significant part of the world. Now, here's Simon. It's great to be with you. My only regret is that I haven't even had time in between seminars to go for a pee. Um, because I've just dashed from the other venue and got technical issues. You, what, you, what you just missed was actually an incredibly hard-hitting six-minute film called Screaming Injustice. Uh, I've done a discipleship series uh, of 13 films, a bit like Rob Bell's numerous stuff, but, slightly, but different as well. Um, and 13 films with 13 chapters on radical discipleship. And uh, that film, well, I mean, it, it's just very powerful because the context I live in is very different from yours. I've lived... Uh, from about 12 years ago, I'm briefly based in America until August right now with my family. Uh, but my context of living has been here, Central Africa, Burundi, piddly Burundi, insignificant Burundi, uh, not even known for its war, whereas Rwanda to the north is at least known for the war because Rwanda was so bad in uh, 1994, 800,000 to a million people killed. Well, Burundi was the end of 1993. And only 300,000 people died in our 13-year war. And I lived through seven of those years, and we're still there. And uh, it's been an incredible journey. And I'm 38 years old, and I never thought I'd make the age of 30. I never think, thought I'd have the chance to get married and have kids. And I may say that to you so that you know where I'm coming from. This is a message I'm willing to die for. It's a message I thought I'd be dead by now for. Um, but when you live in an extreme environment, when you... A routine, you hear three shots and found out later that it's your, your buddy's head that's been blown off when someone comes to your house with a grenade to blow you up, when someone writes to you and says they're going to cut out your eyes. Those experiences aren't necessarily pleasant, but they're incredibly sharpening. And you're not going to waste your life. And if you think you might die next week, today's going to count. And I've seen so much injustice. And at the start of that film, the first line, as that little baby was screaming, Josephine, was me, uh, the voiceover was, I think God wants us to get angry. Now, please don't think I'm just living out of an angry place the whole time. And that, uh, you know, because anger can destroy you. But an anger, anger can be a sin, right? I mean, it's often a sin. But anger can absolutely be the heartbeat of God. So when Jesus saw the misuse of his father's house, he got angry. And there's plenty of stuff that God wants us to get angry about. Now, the title of this talk is Screaming at Justice. The subtitle is The Cost of Compassion. And uh, I'm just going to give you, you know, a few minutes of introduction so that you know where I'm coming from. That's where I've lived and worked out of, Bujumbura. The road up to Ngozi was the most dangerous road in the world. I got through that road and came, you know, found out later that 40 people had died along there. Um, but you're immortal until God calls you home. And that's what a colleague, Lena Cross, said to me a few years back, that glint in his eye, you know, if you're, if you're in the Lord's will, the safest place to be is in the heart of his will. And safety is in the absence of danger. It's the presence of God. And uh, so I speak a language called Kirundi, that's how it sounds. Um, French as well. And I, I run a charity called Great Lakes Outreach. It's not Lake Superior, Michigan, Erie, Huron, Ontario. It's Lake Tanganyika, Kivu, uh, Victoria, that sort of thing. We are on the longest lake in the world, Lake Tanganyika. And uh, I run a charity out there, which the Lord has just blessed unbelievably. In, you know, the, 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 the light shines in the darkest places brightest, isn't it? Uh, and the Lord just pulled out blessing. I went out with a few hundred bucks in the world, and the Lord has given me millions. But that's because... 
Uh, we're blessed to be a blessing. And we're meant to be conduits of his grace and not cul-de-sacs. And if you receive a blessing, you're meant to pass it on. And, and as we've done that, the Lord has, has honored it in an incredible way. So we've got, we support seven local groups there in terms of leadership development, raising up a new generation, a couple of orphanages, several schools. Uh, we've built uh, the best conference center in the country. We've got Muslim evangelism, uh, pioneered an AIDS project, first AIDS project in the country out there, street kids, um, pastor training, youth camps, Bible reading notes theological training by extension. I mean, a whole load of stuff. It's been amazing. It's been absolutely amazing. And it's been painful. And it's been costly. And I've cried a lot. And, you know, to give you just a, a little idea again of, you know, that was a gas station. That was a gas station. Two rooms and 100 kids were locked in that room. Gasoline pool on top. They burned the light. Because they were tall. Two tribes. In short, Tootsies and Hutus. In this case, Tootsies were killed, but don't think that one's the good guys, one the bad guys. It doesn't work like that. It's much more complicated. But I'm dealing with a traumatized population. This lady was given the choice of how to die. She used to be macheted to death or clubbed to death, or if she had 10 bucks, she could buy her bullet. 10 bucks, so she chose to be clubbed to death, and she was cracked in the back of the head, and she fell in a mass grave. Nine of her family were already dead in that grave, and she was buried. And a few hours later, someone walked over that mass grave, and they, the whimper, fished her out. The killers were still there, high on their drugs and witchcrafty stuff, and they were freaked out. They thought she was a ghost, and they let this bloodied mess just walk away. Now look at her, beautiful lady, sister. And uh, she's actually married a pastor. She's had two of her own kids. And she's adopted four kids from the other tribe. That's the power of the gospel, isn't it? We can sort of get the significance, but not really. To adopt those that killed mine. Sometimes we need to experience the reality, Romans 5, 5, that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit he's given us. I went out there in 1998. I went out because I um, took it on the chin when Jesus says, to those who can give much, much will be required. So with privilege comes responsibility. I don't know where you come from in this room, but you're from just about the most blessed nation in the world and the most blessed period of history in the world. And uh, we've all got our issues, I know, but... Uh, with privilege comes responsibility. We're at the top of the pile. And I was. I went to England's most expensive school from a wealthy background. I was on that conveyor belt of success, affluence. Uh, I went on to England's sports university. I love my sport. And then I was in this job. So there I was on that conveyor belt. But I prayed this prayer. God, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. You make it clear. That was my prayer. That's what he wants from you. To not bargain and say, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. And I said, I don't want security, Lord, because security is a mixed blessing. Because when we're secure, then we don't need God. Amen? Mm, not, not much of an amen there. Because <laughs> I think in Edmonton we love security. It's idolatry. I think we need to just realize that God's got big hands. His hands are big enough to, to hold us. So that was my prayer, Lord. I don't want security. I just want to be in your will. That's the safest place to be. And I took time out from uh, my job when I did a, a year's Bible course in London. And for that year, I said, come on, Lord, 24, single, no girlfriend. You can do anything with me. I'll go anywhere. And uh, it came to the second last day, and I was railing at God, saying, look at that, Lord, answer me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, everyone else had their security lined up for the coming year, and I have nothing else. And... Uh, on the second last day, I received a scribbled piece of paper uh, saying, this guy's looking for you, ring this guy. So I rang him up. We met up in the Wall Street equivalent in London called Bishop's Gate. And uh, this guy said, my name's Rob, Rob DeBerry. And uh, I've been praying and I believe God sent me to you. And he wants you to go to Burundi and be involved in youth and mission and evangelism. As he's talking my heart, I was going, God, is this what you've kept me for? So I said to him, thanks, weirdo. I'll think about it. I'll, I'll be spiritual. I'll pray about it. And I went back to my job. I was there in front of the computer and I said okay God if you want to go to this hellhole war zone this hidden country in Central Africa that no one gives a flying monkey about then that means leaving family friends career security everything going to a place where I might get killed where people are trying to kill me so I, I want a radical sign right now in front of the computer to justify such a radical change of career a specific prayer isn't it and you do actually have a number of Burindians here that, that, that they try to get to Canada because of the promised land apparently um, so some of you would have heard of Burundi, but Burundi wasn't our colony in, 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 in England, in Britain, and uh, no one really knows about Burundi. You say, what's Burundi? Is it a piece of cheese? People haven't got a clue. <laughs> and so this was a very specific prayer. Lord, right now in this business development executive position in Woking, in, in southeast of England, right now, if you want me to go to Burundi, give me a sign. And I didn't wait long. 
And I took a phone call and the voice on the other end out of the blue said, you know anyone who wants to work in Burundi? <laughs> that was my call. Now that's no one else's call here, is it? What do you do with that? You've got to go, haven't you? There's no choice. And there's been plenty of times I've wanted to not go subsequently, but you know what? When the Lord calls and it's that clear, you've got to go. And the one who calls you is faithful and he, and he will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24. I've clung to that verse. And uh, it's been, it was an amazing journey, you know. <sighs> amazing. And, uh, and costly and all those things. Uh, and so, right, you know where I'm coming from. Wherever I go, wherever I go in the world speaking, I always say this. I don't want your money. I want your prayers. Okay? Our movement is successful. If that's the right word. It's very fruitful because so many people are praying for us. And in each row, there's a piece of paper now that's going to start moving backwards. So move along the road and backwards. Don't sign up if you don't want to. But if you do, every two months or so, you'll hear an email from me with incredible stories. Like, for example, in the summer, we send out 600 young evangelists into the bush and they go and do the Acts of the Apostles and they get their heads kicked in and they cast out demons and they heal the sick and it's, it's, it's just phenomenal it's, uh, it's mind blowing and last summer one on one they led 30,000 people to Jesus in two weeks but this, this is one on one this is saturation outreach very intentional in communities loving with follow up uh, but with persecution you know so I'm not, it's not a soft sell but you know, please sign up. But if you don't want to, no worries. But it just means that you can pray for us, and you'll get stories that will encourage you. Sometimes we're in front of our desk or at home, and God's you know a bit small, and we're we're struggling. And then you get, oh, okay, he's still doing stuff. He's alive and well, and it, it's a win-win essentially. Um, okay, that's it. Introduction. You know where I'm coming from. Screaming injustice, the costs of compassion. This is not a preach, is it? It's a uh, it's more like a seminar, I suppose. But, uh, you know, I really hope this session will get under our skin and apply to all of us. Let's kick off with Matthew 9, 35 to 38. And Jesus went through all the towns. By the way, if you want these notes, sign up on your email. Just email me saying, uh, lob us your notes. I'm very into quotes. You'll hear that. Uh, and I'll just send this. I'll send you the attachment of, of these notes. Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I'll tell you a story, a true story. Then there was 28, when the factory where she worked closed down. Employed and desperate for money, she answered an advertisement in a local paper for au pair work in Edmonton. She's in, she's in Eastern Europe, Eleanor. Met with her recruiter. Helped her fill in some forms and told her that a visa would be arranged for her. She was asked to pay a $700 deposit up front before traveling, which she did with support from her family. Elna, who believed she was traveling legally, handed her passport over to her Moldovan trafficker at the start of the journey. Together, they traveled overland by car, coach, and plane to Canada, by Prague, Spain, Germany, France, and Dublin. Elna realized she was traveling illegally when the traffickers gave her an Italian passport to use between France and Spain. She arrived in the Edmonton region. Eleanor was told she owed her traffickers 30,000 bucks in travel costs. And that she'd have to work as a prostitute to pay them back. She was taken to a brothel where she spent four months and seven days a week having sex with up to 20 men a day in three different flats. Uh, $25 a day for food, cigarettes and condoms. So she had to choose between her health or her sanity. She was told she would pay off her debt much more quickly if she gave special services, including having sex without a condom. She was locked in and only allowed out for work and was permitted no contact with other women. Eleanor was too afraid to say anything about her situation to the men who had sex with her. 
or even to the police who visited the flat once, apartment once, as her traffickers had threatened to harm her family if she did so. Actually, she managed to escape by jumping out of a second floor window after being locked in the apartment alone one day. Elena, Elena now suffers constant back pain from the injury she sustained during her escape and is afraid to go out alone. It's all got tissue. Now, did you, did you cry or did tears come to your eyes when, thank you very much. You know, do tears come to your eye when you listen to Ellen's story? And, you know, in a, in a sense, I hope they did. I actually, I wish that we'd be blessed with the gift of tears. Because otherwise, maybe we've hardened our hearts or, or we're not in touch with our emotions. Or, you know, it's not, you don't have to cry. It's not, not the point I'm making. But this is just a sign of feeling God's heartbeat. She could have been my mother my sister, and she's three blocks away right now. And she's one of many many cities across Canada and across the world. Maybe for us guys, it's actually particularly hard to cry because maybe we weren't meant to. I mean, I came from a stiff upper lip English background. I went to school, never cried at school. I was never cried until I had a profound breakthrough. Maybe we, maybe we keep our tears on the inside. You know, that's a proverb in Burundi about Burundian men. Burundian men, their tears fall in their stomach. It's Amasosi Murundi Agui Munda. Our tears are the first step if we, to, we are to embrace the cost of compassion. Godless taught, right? Spirit, screaming justice, the cost of compassion. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them say he cried on that occasion, but Jesus wept, didn't he? Shortest verse in the Bible. What is compassion? The dictionary defines compassion as a deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with the wish to relieve it. The word compassion comes from the Latin stem compati, meaning suffer with. I, came, I come from a place of many tears. I mean, you've looked at her. This, this, girl, this girl was an abortion. This girl started life as an abortion. She was thrown away uh, uh, as an aborted fetus down a pit of the tree. This aborted fetus landing down there in the filth was still alive. And someone who's about to go to the loo saw her. She was fished out, this discarded piece of flesh. And they clean her off. She weighed two pounds. She was fed through a pet tube like a little bird. And now she's growing up. She's strong, she's fine, and her name's Grace. There were multi murdering rapists, pillaging idiots in Central Africa, very self absorbed people from Edmonton, Calgary, wherever you come from. We all need his grace, don't we? We're down that pit. Maybe it's more respectable sins, maybe it's not murder and rape, but it's selfishness, judgmentalism, conceit, bitchiness, whatever. And, and we need his grace, and we can't get out of the pit by ourselves, but God reaches down. God's the flesh on the incarnation in Christ, and he picks us up and he cleans us up. He says, Come on, live for me. Grace. Yeah, certainly a place of tears. I don't know why that, that, that one's just come up right now, but that's, that's the DVD in the book, and so I'd love you to grab that. And I've just written more recently in the story of the last 10 years, if you want to grab that, Dangerously Alive, African Adventures of Faith Under Fire. And there's my family. So thank you, Lord, for a wonderful wife, a fellow nutter willing to embrace the journey, and, and uh, there's grace, beautiful grace. But you'll come up to your office and say, you know, how can you take your kids into a war zone? For Lizzie, she knew the deal. She is fully compass mentis when I said, are you ready to be a young widow? That was the courtship question. <laughs> it's another deal, isn't it? You know, I'm not an idiot. I love them so much. But I'm not going to live by fear. Are you? Live by faith. Yeah, a place of tears. And pain and suffering, you see those skulls from the genocide, these horrible pictures that left there as a visual reminder of the past so that hopefully we should revisit it. From the dead bodies, it's a visual reminder. But Freddie, who's my best buddy, with whom I, I, I nearly died on a number of occasions, thought I'd die. He's here. I want you to go to the Youth for Christ 
um, booth and you'll see him and you'll just think because he's very demure and self-effacing um, that he is a rock star. You know, uh, he's amazing. This man who never wore shoes or underwear till he was 14, he used to walk two hours to and from school, the only guy from his village to graduate from junior school. Now he's changing the world and he's raising a generation of leaders in that nation. He's amazing. So uh, he wrote to me before I left a while back, and things have settled down, but he wrote to me, please don't stop shedding tears for Burundi because we Burundians, we've got no tears left to cry. So I've had the choice before God of either hardening my heart, calling for cynicism, and giving up hope of making a difference, or of, according to our definition, embracing a deep awareness of the suffering of others coupled with a wish to relieve it, to suffer with. In Bible speak, we are invited to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. Uh, Philippians 3.10 and, and Romans 8.17 says that we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may, we may also share in his glory. So it makes me weep to think of Eleanor, the Eleanors here. It makes me weep to think of the women in Congo and Burundi who have been Basically raped. Let's not even dwell on that picture. It's not nice, but out there it's been a tool of war. Rape women. It demoralizes the men. And then it was just rape the women. They shoot them in the vagina. And you see, we don't want to know this, but at least you've come to the thing on, inju- on injustice, right? So you knew it wasn't going to be nice. I don't want to know that stuff, but these are our sisters. It makes me weep to think of uh, that little boy there. He watched his mum and dad hacked to death. He was forced to eat his dad. in a rubbish dump. He'd been eating mud for a year and had to cut stones out of his gums. But please don't let me finish the talk for coming back to his story because it's very redemptive, okay? So flag me up for the closing prayer. Ignorance is bliss, but we're not called to be ignorant. Indeed, in this age of you know, access to information, there's, there's just no excuse for it at all. And my temptation, your temptation, it might be to... Uh, well, your temptation, your temptation might be to, to come and help me out in Burundi, but, you know, that's really not my agenda because, as I said, there are, there are lots of elders down the road. Um, where do we fit in his plan? And in 1 John, sorry, in John 11, verse 35, we read of Jesus' reaction when one of his best mates died. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Well, maybe we need to pray, Lord, forgive us. Forgive me for looking at the world with dry eyes. One time I cried. You might think I cry all the time. I really don't. But uh, um, you know, the, the, point, the first point is tears. Um, when I was in Brazil a few years ago, uh, you know, we can be clueless. Short-term missions, they're good. But, you know, we've got to be careful, haven't we? And I went on a short-term mission trip to Brazil. And I'd been told that we were going to save 7 million Brazilian street kids in three weeks. You know, it's not like that, is it? And uh, we went to the Central Square in Sao Paulo, and uh, it was actually the scariest experience I've been through in my life. Um, We were ambushed by these street kids. You know, street kids aren't cute. They've been abused. They've had to attack people to survive. They're dangerous. And we were attacked and they threw glass bottles at us and we sprinted, we needed police protection. And we came back that evening as a team and we grew, we went around a circle to process this experience. And I just broke down and wept. The innocence robbed of them. The police at night were going around shooting, killing as vermin. I wept. It said something very powerful, which was on the film that we can't see. Pity cries. I was crying. He cries and then goes away. Compassion stays. I choose to stay. I've had a bit of my experience, but you don't know, you know, that quite how privileged background it was I came from, but we, I maybe we've already said that. With privilege comes responsibility. We recognize here how privileged we are, and it is all relative, isn't it? My pastor's brother died in his arms, 18 year old brother died in his arms because he didn't have five bucks for the medicine across the counter. It's five bucks for life. That's wrong, isn't it? God wants us to get angry. 
And I've had that disease on 10 times. I've <laughs> got an amazing resume of tropical disease. But you see, I've got five bucks, so I'm still around to tell the tale. So thank you, Lord, for our privilege. Thank you, Lord, that we're so privileged. We've got that privilege. We've probably got a lot of talents here. So that's the next T. I'm going to give you four T's. Just our tears, but our talents. Again, I can send you through these notes if you want. I hope that every single person here believes that you, you're not here by accident. You're not who you are by accident. You, it's not what you do is not by accident. That God has got his hand on each one of us. I hope that you, all of us, have a sense of calling and that we don't reduce calling to the religious people, to the professionals, because that's a totally screwed up false dichotomy. Everything's spiritual. And uh, there's an amazing array of talents here, isn't there? And there's an amazing amount of potential if we're willing to buy into it. Back in 1787, William Wilberforce told the House of Commons, a place where the parliamentarians meet, he said this, so enormous, so dreadful, so irremedial is the slave trade's wickedness that my own mind is completely made up for abolition. Let the consequences be what they may. I, from this time, determine that I will never rest until I have effected its abolition. Now, the historian G.M. Trevelyan described it as one of the turning points in the history of the world. Because we all know now that uh, the slave trade was abolished, although, as we've heard with Eleanor, it's still alive and well in different guises. But you see, it was achieved against seemingly insurmountable odds. You know, by all accounts, uh, Wilberforce was ugly. He had a weak constitution. He was of the despised evangelicals or enthusiasts. The practice of slavery was almost universally accepted, and it was integral to our Great Britain. What made us great? Slavery. Opposition, he was against huge mercantile and colonial vested interests, including national heroes like Admiral, Admiral Lord Nelson and most of the royal family. He was vilified and even physically assaulted, but he persevered for nearly 50 years until he accomplished his goal, and he died just after it was enacted. The Lord gave him that joy. You know, the point I want to make as I recount that history is that he almost, missed. because he was converted, he had an experience of God, age 25 in 1785, and he was already in politics, but he thought, right, I'm... I need to go into the church now. I need to do something spiritual. Because spiritual affairs are far more important than secular affairs, so he thought. And thankfully, John Newton, of Amazing Grace fame, who was a former slave trader himself and then became a reverend and Anglican minister, John Newton intervened and persuaded him to stick to politics. John Newton said, it is hoped and believed that the Lord has raised you up for the good of the nation. That's echoes of Esther 4, isn't it? And Mordecai saying to Queen Esther, who knows, but you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And may you hear that where you are as a mum, as a dad, as a professional, as a student, whatever, in our respective spheres of influence here. Who knows? That you've come to such a position, well, royal position for her, but where you are, for such a time as this. And so after much prayer and thought, Wilberforce agreed that his calling was to champion the liberty of the oppressed as a parliamentarian. And he wrote in his journal in 1788, my walk is a public one, my business is in the world, and I must mix in the assemblies of men or quit the post which providence seemed to have assigned me. Praise God. John Newton and uh, that advice and how Wilberforce wasn't just a good regular parson vicar but he was used with the Clapham sect as a team, wasn't an individual it's a lot of people together, pulling together and persevering over decades for the horrific entrenched systematic down. Now Osgoodness says this, calling is the truth that God calls us to himself so decisively 
that everything we are, everything we do, everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism lived out as a response to his summons and service. So you're a lawyer, you know, you can do pro bono stuff, can't you? Can't you? you can, uh, you know, IGM do great stuff, actually, with sexual trafficking as well and slavery in general. I just think about your career and how it can be used because it can be used and it could be in the political arena as we just seen or it could be in the media it could be in the arts last night's talk you know we need, to, we need Christians in the arts and education and business wherever and please listen out for his call think about your life more in terms of vocation than career the cost of compassion involves your talents We've had two T's. The cost of, inca- of the compassion involves tears, involves talents. Third one, time. Right. It, you know, actually, if you look at those three, the first three, Wilberforce demonstrated all those. And it certainly took him a lot of time. It was decades. It's four and a half decades of dogged perseverance and determination. And he, he held a minority opinion and perspective when he started. But listen, listen, majorities normally don't change things. Creative minorities do. And the majority ends up just going along with it. As anthropologist Margaret Mead famously said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Now, we're in a minority in this nation. We hold a minority position. But majorities don't change things. Concerted, strategic, engaged minorities do. And the majority just goes along with it. So we need to speak up. We need to assume our right, the prophetic voice of the church, on the school board, wherever. You know, there's so many different avenues that we can pursue. But, uh, you know, as a, a sort of salient reminder from Martin Niemüller, who was a pastor in a German confessing church, and he spent seven years in a concentration camp, and he said this, first they came for the communists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the labor leaders, but I didn't speak up for the labor leaders because I wasn't a labor leader. And then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out for the Jews because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me. Now, over the last number of years, I get a chance to speak at none of these conferences around the world. And... Uh, um, I do this particularly in England because I'm more networked there, but I, I choose a campaign. And I go around the conferences and I love doing it, particularly with youth, because, you know, fight me back on this one. But older people, um, you've lost your idealism. Say that's wrong. You haven't. You haven't. Good. But you know what I mean? And young people still believe they can change the world. And so I say, look, we're going to do this campaign right now. So, you know, a couple of years ago uh, in the Philippines, the Philippines have shined up, signed up the charter, the UN rights to the child. Children should not be in prison with adults because what happens when that, you know, they get buggered and all sorts. And, and so they've signed their signatories, but they're not abiding by that. So we're going to campaign for kids your age. You're out there right now. And next year, I'll be able to come back and see if that law has been enacted. So we sign up, takes 20 seconds. And then I came back next year and we changed that law. Campaigning works. I want us to believe that we can say, I haven't done one this time, but, you know, we could, we could you know, pick something. There's all sorts of stuff we can sign up to through there. Um, or whatever, you know, the, the, the stalls for the kiosks and that sort of thing. But Edmund Burke got it right when he said that all that it takes for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. The guy on death row in Iran right now, he's been there a long time. Many of you have heard of him, past Madarkani. It's only Khamenei who can release him now because the Supreme Court has said death. And we know about it because people have campaigned. And he's not dead today because we've campaigned. And it'll be a huge embarrassment to the regime. And he may yet die. So the campaign's not over. Do you see what I mean? There's all sorts of, again, the end of my film on Screaming Injustice, uh, the end of it, I'm walking on and I say, please just pick a fight. You know, it could be domestic violence. It could be, it could be the slaves, sexual trafficking. It could be, you know, just go through it. Racism. There's all sorts of stuff, but pick one fight. We can't do everything, but we can do something. 
persecuted church, sign up for the Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors or Christian Solidarity Worldwide, these groups, get their petitions and, and do it because they work, they work. I've done one almost every year. And, you know, the Chinese believer in prison, that one took three years to get him out of prison. But, the, you know, it takes work. Change the world that way. Let me tell you a story about a little boy who took up some of my time. It's Bongani, 10 years old. Dying of AIDS. And I was preaching in South Africa a few years ago, and uh, Bongani had buried his mum. His dad was long gone, and he went with the virus, and he was dying, and he was just about dead. And then he was told that his dream was going to come true, which was that he was going to see the sea. He was going to take him six hours down from Johannesburg to Durban Beach. That's Durban Beach, and he was going to get a chance to see the sea, and he. You know, I had three days with him, and he wasn't a fun boy to be with because he was dying. He didn't say anything. Let's see, his eyes lit up. And we put on his sweet socks and paddled into the water. And incredible joy, and then big wave came. He was scared, we got back out. But he had his dream. Okay, now that big strapping lad on the other side of me, he, uh, I actually met him on the back of a donkey in the Egyptian desert. And... Um, there was something familiar in his eyes. South African guy, I said, did you do all your schooling in South Africa? He said, yes, apart from three years at a prep school in Buckinghamshire. And I said, Anthony Farr, he's my tennis partner when we were 10 years old. <laughs> and he wasn't converted. And he changed his holiday plans. He came back with us to Cairo and he came to church. And then in England, he did an alpha course and came to Christ. He left merchant banking. He started a group called Starfish. You know the Starfish story? Some of you, there's been a storm and tens of thousands of starfish are washed up on the shore and a starfish out of water is going to die and you've got this little boy in his youthful zeal and he's walking along and he's bending over, he's picking them up one at a time, he's throwing them back in, but a lot of starfish here. He's not making much of a dent. So an old cynical guy says to him, walks past him and says, hey little boy, you're wasting your time. What's the point? You can't make a difference. There are so many. Give up. What difference can you make? And the little boy listened respectfully, and then he bent over and picked another one up. And he threw it. He said, well, it made it sound so profound. Well, then it's just a starfish, right? But he's not, he's not just a black kid on a photo. Well, he is for you, for me. He's my little buddy. And, and uh, I had those three days with him, and he started warming to us. And, and then uh, we were driving back to Johannesburg, and it was cold in the back of a truck. And it was nighttime, and he snuggled up in the dark in the crook of my neck, this snotty-nosed, husky lung little boy who was dying. And Anthony had flummoxed me with the question, what's God's purpose in Bogdani's life? If we get it today, what difference can we make? Make lives to it. What difference can we make? Thank God he doesn't see us as 500 people in this room. Statistic. I said of Dorothy Day, who's the founder of the Catholic uh, Worker Movement, that she loved the truth enough to live it. Loved the truth enough to live it. Ask myself that. Maybe we can add one last T. Here's talents, time, and treasure. Kirk said, as long as there are people suffering without the basic necessities of existence to hold on to riches, displays an attitude of disobedience to God. I don't know if you agree with that. The Christian aid slogan was, live more simply that others may simply live. Bono, or as my mom says, Bono, um, said, your pockets are full and now you've got to figure out what to spend it on. If you're going to live up to your ideals and your education, it's going to cost you. The early church was amazing, wasn't it? Uh, a book that some of you might like to read is Rodney Stark's The, the Rise of Christianity. He's, a, an, he's not a believer. He's a, just a sociologist applying sociological theory to the early church. And he, through his research, estimates that the Roman Empire was conquered for Christianity, overcome by these loving Christians who love the truth enough to live it under persecution within 300 years. They went from nothing to being the Roman Empire being over, he guesstimates, over 50% evangelical Christian. Such that when Emperor Constantine declared the Roman Empire Christian, uh, he did it out of political expediency. They'd already lost the battle. And it's because they just loved these people that died and they get caught with disease, but they just carried on. And incredible demonstrations. 
if you uh, do research into the early church. But way back, you know, in Acts 4, the sermon pick out each little word of this. Acts 4.32, all, all, this is for everyone, all the believers, that's all of us, were one in mind and heart. None of them claimed that any of their possessions were their own. Ouch. They shared everything they had. And what followed? With great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And much grace was upon them all. There were no needy people among them. It seems so hard for us to embrace that because we've gone so far down the, you know, from our cultural conditionings of, you know, individualism. Wonder, you know, was God, I love that, much grace is upon them. It's a lovely phrase, much grace is upon them. Is there a lot of grace in your life? And I think there's a, there's a correlation. Was God so liberal with his, gra- with his grace because they were so liberal with their lives and their stuff? Because they didn't hold on to their stuff. They just shared it as there was need. Because the Roman Empire, Emperor Hadrian asked Aristides, his, his advisor, just who exactly are those Christians? And although Aristides wasn't one, he gave the following summary. They love one another. They never fail to help widows. They save orphans from those who would hurt them. If they have something, they give freely to the one who has nothing. If they see a stranger, they take him home. And they're happy as if he's a real brother. What an incredible testimony. Saints of Aristides Day. And unfortunately, such effusive endorsement isn't always the case, is it? There's one grubby little urchin in the slums who's being teased by his friends. You know, he's, he's a you know, Christian, this little boy, this urchin in the slum. And they, they were mocking him. They said, ha, you say that God loves you. Well, if that's the case, why doesn't he look after you? Why doesn't God tell someone to bring you shoes and a warm coat and better food? And the little urchin thought for a moment. And then with tears starting in his eyes, he replied, but he forgets. I don't want to forget. And you're here, aren't you? Because you don't want to forget. Age, access to information, ignorance is bliss. You know, it just loses plausibility. It can't. And, you know, I've got loads of stats here. I don't know if you want stats in terms of the world as, as it is. And uh, I, I, I noticed that Ron Sider's uh, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger has just been updated, and I haven't read it yet. But um, I'd urge you to get that book, Rich Christians in, in, an of, in, in an Age of Hunger. That was a seminal text about 20 years ago. And I think literally... Well, I've only just seen it updated. Maybe I'm wrong. But, uh, from an African perspective, in 1948, Africa's share of global trade was 5.3 percent. By 2002, it had, it had fallen to a wretched 1.7 percent. Why? Because we, the winners, the rich countries, write the laws on international trade. So we protect our. Let me pick an issue that's very European. Maybe it's yours. But if you're offended by this, sorry. Um, you know, we protect our farmers. Unbelievable billions of billions of euros of subsidies for our farmers to produce at costs that the Africans can produce far cheaper for. They can't compete with the subsidies. They don't receive billions. And so they just die. That's an issue of injustice. And it's very complex, so... I'm quite sure of that. But uh, you know, experts say that if the continent could regain just an additional, having lost 3% since the, 3. 6% since the Second World War of world trade, if they could regain just an additional 1% of global trade, it would earn $70 billion more in exports each year, almost six times what it receives in foreign aid. Crazy, isn't it? And, you know, we're, we're part of the system. Um, so these are I mean, massive issues, aren't they? They're very challenging. What can we do about it? Cider quotes a World Bank study showing that approximately 1.3 billion people uh, live on less than a dollar a day. Another 2 billion surviving on less than $2 a day. Clark Pinnett writes that the story of the rich man and Lazarus ought to explode in our hands as we read it, sitting at our well-covered tables while the third world out stands outside. He asks us the penetrating question, have we allowed our economic self-interest to distort our interpretation of Scripture? But to the extent of our belief in scriptural authority, we will permit painful texts to correct our thinking. Wow. 
I, I just wonder how future generations will look back on a time when many of us in the West are obsessed with avoiding obesity while much of the developing world doesn't have enough to eat. It's heavy, isn't it? And, uh, but it is heavy. <laughs> you know, I was almost going to apologise for being heavy, but, you know, it is heavy. And we want to engage in the heartbeat of God. So, you know, basic education for the whole world would cost six billion dollars a year, eight billion dollars a year spent on cosmetics in the US alone. Station of water and sanitation for the whole world would cost nine billion dollars, but eleven billion dollars is spent in ice on ice cream in Europe. Healthcare and nutrition, the whole world would cost thirteen billion, but seventeen billion is spent each year in the US and Europe on pet food. 55 billion is spent on business entertainment in Japan. 50 billion is spent on cigarettes in Europe. 105 billion on alcoholic drinks in Europe. You know, I mean, they're, they're just crazy statistics, aren't they? UNDP reports it would cost $80 billion a year to wipe out poverty from the planet. And that's less than half of 1% of global income. And it's about the equivalent of the combined net worth of the seven richest men on the, on the world. Now, statistics, statistics, what do they mean? But it's, it's, it's telling, isn't it? It's challenging. We've got a challenge, you know. I, I love Wilberforce's catchphrase. His catchphrase was making goodness fashionable. And uh, the likes of Wilberforce and the Clapham group of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, they were powerfully used to transform Britain. Uh, as they, they lobbied, they campaigned, they sensitized people to the social injustices of slavery, factory and slum conditions, many other important issues. They were used to radically reshape and realign British life until every, every indicator of morality and decency revealed marked improvements, drunkenness, crime, children born out of wedlock, infant mortality, education for the poor, life expectancy, all improved thanks largely to those guys. And they are credited with basically, uh, and going back a bit, I guess, with the Wilberforces and Whitfields, but the Christian infants in England was credited with helping England avoid a French-style revolution. Whereas in the past, the church has often, not always, you know, let's, let's rejoice and celebrate the victories where the church is assuming its rightful place and prophetic role and voice. But whereas in the past, the church has often failed, the challenge for us now in Edmonton, wherever we come from, Canada, in the 21st century is to prophetically call and enact Christ's heart for his precious but degenerate world. The Enlightenment culture has failed an end. Whoever man, well, baby, there was a fire in this house. Some mud and the whole fire burned down. No, sorry, the whole house burned down and mum and dad died and the kids died. But someone at the last minute managed to jump in through the flames and pluck out this baby. Stay. The elders, the whole village convened. And they, and various people laid claim on this baby because he must be a special baby because the spirits had allowed him to live. So you had the neighbor who claimed the baby because the father had an unpaid debt. You had the wealthiest man who claimed the baby because he could provide. You had the village chief who said, well, no, I'm the village chief, so it's my right. And you had the witch doctor who said, no, I must have this baby because he's got special powers. And, and then there's nobody. Poor, disheveled, raggedy man stepped forward and said, no, the baby's mine. Who are you? What's your claim of the baby? Burnt, charred hands. Cost of compassion. Look at Jesus' hands himself to rescue us. We belong to him. And he said, let's finish. Oh, does that relate to our cynical world? Cynicism comes out of despair. But the antidote to cynicism is not optimism. Action. Action is finally born out of hope. And the hope that we have it is in Jesus Christ, whose who, who scarred hands reach out to us, embrace us, they comfort us, they heal us, they, they endorse us, they, they, they draw us along with him, beckoning us and even pushing us out into the world to live lives of costly compassion. 
So in this talk, I've been teeing you up to embrace the cost of compassion. And please, please don't think you can't make a difference. Please choose to offer up to God your tears, your talents, your time, your treasure, and he will use you to change the world. And I'll do it in Burundi. You do it wherever he calls you. In politics, in the media, in arts, education, business, advocacy, entertainment, whatever. But it'll most certainly cost you. But it will mean that you'll, you'll get to the end of your life and you won't be like most people and even many Christians who have sat there with loads of stuff in front of TV and a shriveled soul in a recliner and think, I've, I just missed it. Missed it. That would be tragic. Maybe the tragedy and the challenge that I can leave you with is maybe 80% of us will do that. And shout at me, no, Simon, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to settle for that. But you see the challenge. We are going to have to be so intentional in how we live. And so husbands and wives, go away from this talk and think, talk about it together, discuss it. We've got to be on the same page. I can't do this by myself, but I can do it in community. I can do this as a life group. I can't do it as big church. Big church is too big. That's not how the early church did it. They did it in oikoses, in, in, in households, extended communities. That's the way it's going to be modeled. That's not dissing, knocking big church. But how are we going to live this? You can't live that as a body like this. I've got to share my life with you. Just a couple, we get together, we pull resources, and, and we embrace the cost of compassion. But it's not a soft sell. It's going to cost you your tears, your talent, your time, your treasure. Who or what are we waiting for? Because we are the ones we've been waiting for. Lord, I thank you for my precious brothers and sisters here. Lord, I thank you for your extraordinary grace in our lives. I thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your scarred hands. Thank you that you embrace the cost of compassion. And Lord, I pray for some righteous anger to infuse every single heart and mind here. I pray that every single person here would pick a fight with some cause, some issue. We would refute and rebuke the charge of Edmund Burke that all that takes the evil to prosper. It's not do nothing. We will make a difference. We're going to chuck, throw starfish back in by the bucket load. But I give you my tears again. All for you. I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. Boy, thank you. That boy... He, um, so that picture, he's, th he's eight years old, eight years old in my, in, uh, my arms. He's the size of a three-year-old. Well, when he was eight years old, he obeyed Jesus. And Jesus said, love your enemies and bless those who persecute. If you, and if you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. And if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. How hard is that? But that's got to be grace, hasn't it? It's got to be supernatural. But he forgave his mum and dad's killers, the people that made him do that stuff. And do you know what happened when he forgave? Just keep things quiet here now because I think some of you just need to pray with each other. Or you know, some of us, we have got to go, but uh, sometimes the, the, the atmosphere is just diffused straight away. Let's move on to the next thing. If you need to spend time with the Lord, do that, please. Um, can I have those sheets of paper back? If you didn't get the chance to sign up for email, please come up here and do that. Um, I'd love to see some of you tomorrow. We've got two more sessions and across the other side. But uh, thanks for coming. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at BreakForthMinistries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, May you become fully alive in the love of God.